place, but the insulation does pretty well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it's nice. I was, I was surprised, so praise God for the good insulation. <laughs> Y'all can hear me now? Yes. All right, very good. <clears throat> Today we're going to be in chapter 6. Last week we were in chapter 4, but the first time I was with you, I did Judges chapter 5 because I thought I was going to be filling in. So we already went over chapter 5, so we're going to go from chapter 4 last week to chapter 6 because we already covered chapter 5. I don't want you all to say, hey, we already did this, yeah. right? So we can hear it again, though. Yeah, no, that's true. Right. Remember, uh, to keep Pastor Johnny in your prayers, um, it's just, it's very hard on his body. And so we know that Jesus, he's still the healer, though. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to finish up Judges, and then uh, if the Lord wills, that I'm here periodically, we'll go uh, to the book of Revelation. You don't want to miss that. It's a good study. Judges chapter 6. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it was established in the heavens, Lord God. We thank you that your word became flesh and dwelt among men, and his name is Jesus. So we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that every promise in this word is for us. And you keep your promise. You are the good father. Even when our earthly father fails us, you never do. So help us to trust you, Lord God, in all things. In Jesus' name, and his people say, Amen. Now, the time of the judges was just prior to the time when the children of Israel had kings. Okay? There's a 400-year period of time where the people came into the promised land. And 400 years later, Saul is anointed king of Israel. Okay, by Samuel. He was the first king of Israel. Yep. And during this time of the judges, the people always wanted something that they could see and touch and worship. God wasn't that. They couldn't see God. They couldn't touch him and, and have their hands on him and worship him. And so the people would continually drift off into idolatry and heathen worship whenever a judge would die. So God would raise up a judge, the people would cry out to the Lord, the judge would deliver them, then after 40 years, or sometimes 10 years, then the people would go back to their heathen worship. And we learned last week that even the governors couldn't keep the people in line. After the judge died, the people would still go back to their old ways. And I always wonder, why do we go back to our old ways? You know, why do we keep going back to that place? It's the enemy, right? The enemy comes in and see these people were living among the enemy. They became their friends, their neighbors, and they became just like them. And so we always got to remember who we hang out with, right? Or the places we go. When one judge would die, there'd be a gap, and then they would go back to their heathen gods. In the book of Judges chapter 2, verse 19, God said this, And it came to pass, when the judges were dead, they returned to their corrupt selves, even more than their fathers, in following other gods to serve them and bow to them, and they never ceased, not from their own doing, nor from their stubborn ways. So I think a lot of times the problem was stubbornness, right? Because the Bible says they went to their stubborn ways. How many of you know that you can't be stubborn when it comes to walking with the Lord? Because stubbornness means it's my way, not your way. That's what stubbornness is. So they said this is going to be our way. So Judges chapter 2 tells us this. It reminds us that this was what was happening with the people. So the stiff neck people, right? Stiff neck. That means stubborn. That's good. That's good. Now let's go on to uh, verse 1 of chapter 6. It says that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midians seven years. Now these Midianites are the same people that Moses' father-in-law came from. Midian was actually a son of Abraham. And the Midianites came from a woman named Keturah, which is Abraham's second wife. So the Midianites were a people from the bloodline of Abraham. But what happened to these people? The people, Abraham's children, lived in the land of Canaan and they mix with the Ishmaelites, they mix with the Canaanites, they mix with the other people in the land, and pretty soon the Midianites became the enemies of Israel. But they had the same father, Abraham. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. So, so Moses had a wife 
Her name was Keturah, and that's found in Genesis chapter 25, verse 1 and 2. And, and there's a son named Midian. That was, that was the father. And these are the offsprings of the Midianites that intermarried with the Ishmaelites and other nations. Um, let's go ahead and see verse 2. And the hands of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them a den, which are in the mountains and the caves and strongholds. So these Midianites, they're basically robbers and nomads. They didn't have a land they called their own. They, they were wanderers. And what they did is whenever Israel would plant a field, they would go and steal everything from Israel. So the Israelites were driven into the caves, and the Midianites were just robbing them. So they would plant food for their family and for their people. The Midianites would come in and just wipe them out. The enemy robbed from God's people because they didn't have their armor on. They weren't defense. They were defenseless, right? If you keep your armor off and if you get the enemy t time to come in your life, he'll rob you too. And that's what the Midianites, they were robbers. And they stole the wealth and the Israelites were in dens and caves in the mountains. And what the Israelites would do is that they would actually hide their wealth in the mountains and the caves. That way the Midianites can't take it. So they would stash their wealth inside these caves. The, Mid the Midianites, they weren't so interested in killing anyone. It's like some of the other enemies of Israel. They were more of just stealing from them. And in verse 3 it says, And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. So, for the past seven years, every time the Israelites would plant a crop, right before the harvest, the Midianites would come in masses. And really, it made it tough for the Israelites to feed their family when winter came. When winter came, they would starve. Just think of how you would feel if every time you had to support your family by planting a crop so that that was the food they had to eat and some knucklehead would come and rob your field right before harvest, what would you do? How would you support your family? How would you feed your family? That's what was happening here. This was a real problem. But what was the cause of their problem? It was themselves. Don't you know that sometimes we're our own worst enemy? <laughs> Isn't this true? We're our own worst enemy. Because of the things that we choose to do. The foolishness, the, the drive from other people around us, it causes us to be very, very foolish sometimes. That's why we gotta say, please Lord, keep these people from me. Keep anything that doesn't need to be in my life, out of my life. Do you know I pray that prayer every day? I say, Lord, the things that need to be in my life, bring. And the things that don't need to be in my life, get away. Wow. And if you really wanna live in God's will, then you gotta do that. But you also gotta trust that he gives and takes, and sometimes he takes away things that we might like. And you're praying, God, take it away from me. And then when he takes it away, you complain. <laughs> so sometimes wow. we're stubborn and stiffed up people, aren't we? We can be yeah, stubborn sometimes. <laughs> we are spiritual Israel, very much so. So here we go. Water break. Okay, verse 4. This is the Midianites. It says that they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza. And left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So these Midianites wiped them out completely. Verse 5 says, For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. So basically, they stripped the land and left nothing for them. Um, the, the Bible describes grasshoppers and locusts as creatures that would come in swarms, and they come into a crop of a field, and literally go through it, and when they leave, Wipe it's gone. It's gone. And this is what they did. They came with their camels. The Bible says there were so many of them, it was hard to number. And they would come into the fields of Israel and just clean them out. All their hard work, gone. Look at verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So once they reached the end of their ropes, 
They can see no way out of the situation. Then they cried out to the Lord. Remember, every time a judge, right before a judge would come, what did Israel do? Cry out to the Lord. The first and the beginning of victory in your life, we said this before, is to cry out to the Lord. It's the first step in victory. God, I can't do it anymore. I surrender. Full surrender. So they reach the end of their ropes and they cry out to the Lord. And it says that it came to pass that when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto thee, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. So this prophet from God, he's reminding the people of Israel of the miracles that God did for them. He says, listen, I brought you out of slavery, bondage. I brought you out of Egypt. I had you cross over the Red Sea on the dry land. I fed you with loaves and fish. I mean, I mean, uh, loaves, manna, and quail, right? Do you realize that this manna fell from heaven? <laughs> Have you ever seen food fall from heaven before? No. It's a miracle. Yeah. But that's how God took care of his people. And the people forgot what God did. So this prophet that God raised up is reminding them of all the good things that God has given them. And it says in verse... Um, Nine. And I delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians, and out of the hands of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their lands. So it looks like these Israelites, or their forefathers, they were kind of spoiled, because God made it so easy for them to just go in. All they had to do was follow God's path, and they would have victory. That's it. Just follow God's path. You want victory? Follow God's path. So Israel is walking, and they're following God's path, and something else looks good. So they start walking on their own path. That's it. That's how it, That's how you mess up, man. That's how I mess up. Wow. Every time. Every time. <laughs> i got to stay on God's path. So God's saying this right here. And it says in verse 10, And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose lands ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So when Israel came to the promised land, they forgot the blessings that God gave them, and they went right into Baalism, the worship of Estor. And verse six, uh, verse 11, it says of chapter 6, And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak, which is an Ogre, that pertained unto Joash in Ambazrites. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress, to hide it from the Midianites. Now Gideon, like I said before, we learned about him in, in verse 5, and now he's here crushing grapes in a wine press, and he's pounding the wheat with a stick, and he's in the wine press, that way no one can see him. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, we have to understand that he's hiding in a wine press, in an orchard, and God is saying, you're the mighty man of valor. Well, a mighty man of valor wouldn't be hiding, right? But see, when God looks at Gideon, he doesn't look at what he sees at the present. He looks at who he is going to be. He's going to be a mighty man of valor. When God looks at me and looks at you, he sees all the potential and everything that we could be in him if we obey. So, so, on all of our faults and all of our weaknesses, if you're a child of God, He doesn't see that anymore. He only sees you as a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor. Amen? And thank God for that. When He looks at me, He doesn't see my faults. He sees a mighty man of valor. Because all of our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. Thank God. When we became a Christian, we've been set free. We've been delivered. We are now a new creature, something that had never existed before. I don't think we understand what that verse means. When when we receive salvation, we become a new creation. And it's very clear in the Greek what it means. It's something that has never been before. A new creature. That means you're not the same as you were. When you were born of water and of your mother's womb, that's gone. You're a new creature now. 
He sees you as whole, as complete. Even though your family doesn't see you that way, your friends don't see you that way, you might not see yourself that way. That's how he sees you. Amen? A new creature. So he sees this man hiding in a wine press because he's afraid of getting killed. And he says, you're a mighty man of valor. That's, that's powerful. It says in verse 13, And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our father told us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hands of the Midians. So this is a face-to-face -face conversation between Gideon and God. God is having this conversation with Gideon, and Gideon saying, Listen, you reminded us that, that you brought us out of Egypt, but here we are being slaves again. In Midian, why is this happening? Verse 14, it says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the land of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So Gideon, Gideon's might is in the Lord. The Lord God Almighty, Yahweh. And God gives the instruction um, through his word. God, Gideon is receiving instruction from God's word. Spoken word, right? So where do you think we get our instruction from? God's word. Same thing. So Gideon is receiving God's word in his ear, and we receive God's word right here. And so that's where the instruction is. That's where the correction is. That's where the deliverance is. That's where we're set free in the word of God. And he says um, in verse 15, And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So Gideon was crying, and he's saying, Listen, I'm the least in my family, and my father's house is the poorest of all the tribes of Manasseh. The poorest in, in the, in the uh, Hebrew here, it's the word um, that you would call the youngest, or the, the least in the family line. So he's saying that they're the poorest in the family line, which means his father and him, they were the youngest in the in the tribe. Okay? That doesn't mean in wealth, but it means in stat in um, picking order. Status. In status, right, in status. So not necessarily in wealth. Okay. Verse 16 says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midians as one man. So God's telling Gideon that the Midianites are many, but God is going to allow Gideon to smite them as if they were one man. That's the power of our God, right? Listen, you can be one man against the whole army, but when you got God on, on your side, you can kick butt, right? Look at David. David... He has, in the valley of the giants, and this Philistine giant is mocking God's people. And he says, I'm going to take that guy out. Did David have a whole army behind him? He did, but not really. Because they were all messing themselves in their pants because of this giant, right? And the Gideon, the Philistine army. But he goes up and he says, listen, I've got God on my side. So this fool's coming down, right? you got the same power. One man can move mountains, right? Because you're not one anymore. God's got your back. And you are a child of God. Your enemy is now his enemy. Right? So don't forget this. I think we need to remember that we are children of God. Right. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are not who we used to be. We are a force to be, not to be messed with, right? That's right. Never forget that you're a child of God. Who are you? Child of God. You're a child of God. And don't let anyone tell you different. You tell them you're a liar. Get out of here. They want to try to tear you down. And it says in verse 17, And he said unto him, I, have, I know I have found grace in thy sight. Then show me in a sign that thou talkest to me. Depart not hence. I pray thee until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So it was customary that you offer something to somebody when you're asking a favor of them. 
and God told Gideon to go and get his gift, and he would wait until Gideon would return. So Gideon's going to get a gift. It says in verse 19, And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes and an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. Notice that this is unleavened cake uh, of bread. An ephah is about 20 pounds of flour in our time. And so there was... 20 pounds of flour during a time when the enemy's coming and robbing you, that's a lot of flour. An ephod is 20 pounds. Do you know how much bread you can make with 20 pounds <laughs> of flour? Of how much is a, is a loaf of bread at the grocery store? Isn't it 16 ounces? Is it generally 16 yeah. ounces? A pound? A pound yeah. So you're looking at 20 loaves of bread. This is what he's putting together for God. But see, he only gives his best for God, right? He's giving an offering, a gift to God. You don't ever give God your second best. Right. You always give him the first. And when you give, you give till it hurts. A lot of people don't understand that. But he's giving a lot. Because he says, okay, God, I'm trusting you. So I'm going to give you this gift. It says in verse 20, And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. So Gideon did exactly what he was told. He was wasting precious bread. He was wasting precious meat. He was wasting precious broth. In our eyes, it looks like he's wasting it. Think about it. He went through all this work. And in those days, you just didn't go to the grocery store and get some meat. You got to take a goat and you got to dress it. You gotta gut it. You gotta get it prepared. You gotta Water. cook it. This was time consuming. You gotta take that bread. You gotta take that wheat and and, and, and grind it and make loaves. 20 pounds worth. And then all of a sudden, God told him to dump it out on the stone. Pretty interesting, isn't it? And the Lord and the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand. And he touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there arose up fire out of the rocks and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Wow. When there is a fire on the altar of God, it means that God accepts the sacrifice that was offered to him. This is kind of similar to the altar that Elijah made to God when he was challenging those 400 prophets of Baal when King Ahab um, they all went up against God's people. Um, and I want to look at the symbol of this verse um, in Judges. The unleavened bread is our Passover today. It symbolizes Jesus Christ's body. It symbolizes the communion table, the unleavened bread. When we take unleavened bread, it means it's, there's no leaven in it. Leaven represents sin, right? Little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. What's leaven? It's like yeast, right? You put the leaven in it, it, it blows up, right? So this unleavened bread is like our Passover. Jesus Christ's body was free from sin, free from leaven. The rock that here is representative of God because he is the one that we build our foundation on, on our life on, right? The rock. That's what we live upon. So now the angel departs and Gideon is alone. Look at verse 22. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not that thou shalt not die. Now, when the angel left and departed, Gideon became afraid because it was written in the word that if you would see the face of God, you would die. And there's a lot of um, speculation and things that people um, that people talk about when it comes to Gideon actually seeing the face of God. But in my Bible, my King James, whenever it talks about the angel, it says he with a capital H. Right. right. So who was Gideon? 
really speaking to? God, right? And he says, oh my goodness, Gideon is saying, I just saw the face of God, I'm going to die. So don't let anyone preach, no man has seen the face of God and lived. Because I'll show you in several scriptures where men have seen God, including Abraham, right? Remember Abraham, he dwelt with uh, under the oak tree with God. So Gideon says, I'm going to die. So the Lord said unto him in verse 23, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. That's what he's talking about here. And a lot of preachers just kind of read over that, and they don't really understand because they teach, well, you can't see the face of God or you'll die. Excuse me, God can do whatever he wants That's to right. do. And if he wants to come down and show his face to one of us, he can do that, right? That's right. So it makes no sense when these preachers are preaching this, and they get to this verse and say, don't worry, you're not peace be with you, you're not going to die. They don't even understand what that means. Because to see the face of God, it, it's scripturally and traditionally taught you will die. Right? The Jews, Orthodox Jews, don't even say the name of Yahweh off their lips. They don't even say the word God. It's too holy. Too sacred. Too sacred. Yes. But we're covered in the blood. Yes. Amen. Uh, it says, and the right. Lord said. The Lord said. The no, nobody else. The Lord said. And it's a capital, right? Yes. That's, he was actually talking to the Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. God. <laughs> and he was fearful. He says, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm going to die. So if you're ever in a service and the, a pastor says, no one's seen the face of God and live, you say, okay. <laughs> then don't argue with them. Some people are just ignorant of God's word. Sorry, that's just what it is. It's ignorance. You do whatever you want. That's it. He, he, he spoke things into existence. I'm sure he can come down and sup with us if he wants to. Okay? Jesus, he's at the right hand of the Father till God tells him to come back to earth. Okay? But God is all omnipresent. Right? He's everywhere. He can do whatever he wants. Verse 23 says, And the Lord said unto them, unto him, Peace unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is at Omrah of the Abizarites. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and in the Mesoric text, it's Yahweh Shalom. It's the sacred name of God. Shalom means peace in Hebrew. So Gideon called this place God's peace, the place of God's peace. Yahweh Shalom. And Gideon called the Lord the Father, Lord of Peace, right? He called him Father. In verse 25 it says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's youngest bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Now remember, we spoke about groves before. Right. So, God just doesn't want this guy to go chop down a bunch of cherry trees or olive trees or or um, orange trees or apple trees. The grove worship is the sexual orgy religious rites that was practiced underneath the trees for these people in Baal worship. Um, that's where they get the, the fertility rites of the Easter Bunny, right? When it comes to Easter, things like that. It all happened, it's spiritual whoredom that's happening in these groves. So Gideon is supposed to be cutting this grove down. Not because God doesn't like the groves, right? He doesn't mind apple groves and orange groves. It is a place of um, spiritual whoredom. These people are worshiping other gods and they're making those teepees out of the, out of the groves and the idols out of the wood from these trees and they're having sexual orgies in these groves. So God says, cut them all down. Amen. This is where Gideon receives his name. Gideon cut down the grove worship to Baal and Eshtar, and his name means the cutter down. The cutter down. Why is Gideon called the cutter down? Because he cut them down. Right? Amen. So understand, that's where Gideon gets his name from. The cutting down of the grove. Now listen, this is something that is... Um, 
very difficult for him. Let's take, for example, a big religion that's in our community today. Um, I don't like talking about other religions, right? Let's just say Catholicism. Let's say that God told Gideon to burn all of the churches, cut all the churches down that are a part of this Catholicism, right? Do you know what kind of pressure you would be under if God told you to start cut, burning those churches down? Wow. Well, let's talk about the Mormon church. I want you to go and take down, cut those stakes off. You know those stakes that stick up in the Mormon church? Yeah. Cut those stakes down and burn the church. What kind of position would you be in in your community if you were the guy known for burning all them churches that are what, according to the word, false churches. You may get offended at that, but I'll come and school you. You come to me afterwards, and I'll school you on that, um, on those false religions. But listen, I had an uncle who was a priest, and an aunt who was a nun. Okay? <laughs> and so, it's just the way it is, you know? It's the way it is. Um, I pray that, you know, well, never mind. Come see me if y'all have a problem with what I said. So get so this is the position that God's putting Gideon in. So he's got to really trust God. Right? Cut him down. Cut him down. Verse 26 says, And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock, in the order place, and take a second bullock and a burnt sacrifice in the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. So God is telling Gideon to clear out all the idols, all the things that were part of the, uh, the grove worship, destroy them, burn them, and then build an altar of God on, this, on the rock where these places were. Understand that they would also have human sacrifice of virgins and of children in these groves. This is um, not a religion of, of, of God. It, it is Satanism. Listen, any type of worship that is not of Yahweh is of Satan. 100%. And if you're offended by that, I'm sorry, but if it's not in the Word, if you're not a church that's established with your foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ, then it is of Satan. That's it. And you are in idolatry, you are whoring after other gods, and you are supposed to be a spotless virgin bride presented before the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom when he comes, and if you are whoring after other gods, you're committing adultery on God, and Israel did too, and God divorced Israel for that. Keep that in mind. Keep your armor on. Don't get involved in these places. And you know, it's, it's so hard these days because I have young people in my church and they say, um, we want to go to this church and play. They want us to play, you know, a band in, our, in their church and everything. And I got to tell them, I said, listen, if you go to those places like that, do you understand that there are spirits in that church that will attach to you, right. and you'll accept it because these people are nice and friendly. And they'll, they'll bring you in, and they'll accept you in, and you're following slowly, um, you're slowly following their God instead of our God. And they say, well, they have a cross on their church. And they have a Bible. It doesn't matter. There are all kinds of spirits in the churches today. And if you're in a church that has a different kind of a spirit that is found in this word, then you're going to be in trouble. Stay away. And it's so hard for the young people to understand that. Don't go there. But they're called something, something Christian church. Don't go there. Don't do it. Well, you just don't want us to go to the... That's not about that. It's about protecting. And I'm, I'm their shepherd, right? God's the shepherd of the church, and I'm the overseer of the church. And my job is to protect them from those things. So please pray for me. That's one of my biggest challenges as a pastor um, is, the, is the young people and, and them accepting everything and everyone. And everything's kumbaya. Well, there is a one world church coming. And if you don't stand separate, you're going to be sucked into this one world religion. Be separate. I told my people, we aren't going to be mixing up with these these guys. We're going to stay independent, separate. Well, you just don't want... No, no, no. It's it's scriptural. And when we talk about Revelation, we'll read that too. Amen, Amen brother. Be aware. Be aware of these things. Just because they got a cross on their building, it doesn't mean they're teaching the truth. And the Kudalini Spirit has entered the church 
It's a spirit, a serpent spirit of the New Age movement. It's a serpent that sits at the base of the spine in the, in the Kundalini, in the Hindu religion, those that practice yoga, and they release and they release that spirit, that serpent spirit, and it awakens you. Okay, in the chakra. And this spirit has entered the church today in the 1900s, the early 1900s. And if you want to do some research on that, it's called the Kudalini spirit. Okay? And it has infiltrated the church of America. And it's disgusting, and it's scary, and it's leading people astray. They're led by their emotions and their feelings instead of the word. And your emotions right. and your feelings will always get you messed up. Right. I'm trying to tell you that's the truth. Right, bro. I don't even know why I'm teaching this before, but someone does. Yeah. What's that? They're led by the spirit, not emotions. I, I told my kid, you know, I didn't get moved by emotions, but get moved. Right. Because you're led by the Holy Spirit, then you're going the right direction. Your emotions will always trick you. Yeah, always. Right. Always trick you. That's the flesh. So I don't know why I went there, but Lord knows. Thank you, Lord. Listen, we are in end times. Yeah. Yes. And you cannot be fooled and deceived right now. Spiritual battle. So like I said, keep keep that in prayer for me as I'm working with my young people. Because they think that any other church is fine if they have a cross on it. They can go and, and do worship with them. And I don't want that spirit coming into our church. I'm the shepherd of the church right now. God put me there as an overseer. Got to protect the people. Amen. Right? So that's how it is. So Gideon, verse 27, took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So Gideon was fearful of the other men in the city, so he went at night and burnt the, cut the groves down. Okay. He still did it. He still got the job done, didn't he? Right. Yeah. But I think he's yeah, kind of using yeah. a little bit of wisdom, though. You know, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves yeah. we're supposed to be. Yeah, if you that. go out there and start burning them up right now, in the middle of the day, you're going to get caught, right? Tell you. you use a little wisdom from the Holy Spirit, you'll be fine. And I, I don't give, I don't knock Gideon on that. I would probably do the same thing. I'd be out there at night, cutting the groves down, right? With, with 10 of my servants. That's right. <laughs> Now, giving Gideon credit, using his head, getting the job done is what it's all about. And what's happening here is he's destroying these heathen gods. Verse 28 says, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullet was offered upon the altar that was built. So now the town started awaking in the morning. The men went to do, the, do their idol worship. And there's no altar. There's no groves for their sexual orgies. It was all gone by the tempers fire. And Gideon knew that there must be a change before God would listen to their cries. And God's instructing them to cut the groves down and get rid of these idols. So there could be a change. Sometimes we need to get the idols out of our life so there can be a change. Right. Don't yeah. expect a change if you're doing the same foolish things. Right. If you got things in your room, things in your life, things in your closet, things in your car, things in your space, get it out first. You want God to move? Clean house. Then do business with God. He'll, he'll meet you right there. He'll meet you where you're at. But if you want to do business with God, if you want to move with God, get it cleaned out. Then see how far God takes you. And look out, devil, because he'll take you, and you'll be gone. God's good like that. Amen. In verse 29, it says, And they said one to another, Who had done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, had done this thing. <laughs> so when the, the town folks started talking, they said, Gideon, the cutter down, did it. They called him Gideon, the son of Joash, the cutter down. In the Hebrew, Gideon means the cutter down. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altars of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. You see, this is a pretty serious matter. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. In archaeology today, 
in archaeological digs, even in North America, they found ancient altars of Baal. Right here. Wow. These symbols that were in Mesopotamia and in Canaan, the same symbols are found in North America. I want you to understand that it is the same spirit, the same serpent god, whether it was in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, North America, South America, it's all Satan. The same, the same altars of Baal are found right here. How is that possible? Different peoples, different lands, different times throughout history. Because Satan is, his fingers are in all, the whole pot of mankind. Whom he will devour. Yes. Wow. There's nothing new under the sun, my friends. Right. Nothing new. Verse 31 says, And Joash said unto them, said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. With it yet mourning, if he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. So after Joash heard the people saying this, he says, don't you have a really big god? You have to do your fighting for him? He says, Baal's, Baal's strong enough to do his own fighting. You don't got to go out and kill the guy. Let Baal handle it, right? It's kind of smart. He's kind of using the people, like their god against them. You don't got to handle your god's business, right? A little reverse psychology. You can let Baal handle it. He's God. Let Baal do the killing himself. Kind of a mocking type thing situation. Verse 32 says, Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altars. So the name Jerubbabel means, Let Baal plead for himself. Let Baal plead for himself. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Verse 33 says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Now Jezreel is kind of a play on words of Israel, right? It means the seed of God. And these Midianites and their friends are the Amalekites. They came under the children of Israel. And it was a time when um, the Midianites would come down to Jezreel and steal everything. It's the time of the harvest. So that's when they're coming down. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abizar was gathered after him. So the Spirit of the Lord is about to do a great work through Gideon. Gideon blew a trumpet, and the troops came together. Verse 35 says, And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers to Asher, and to Zebulun, and to Naphtali. And they came up to meet them. So Manasseh is the largest tribe in number. They won the previous battles. Zebulun and Naphtali, they're right together right to fight the battle. Um, look at verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if by the dew be on the fleece only, and dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. So Gideon wants another sign from God before he leads this huge military group to fight the Midians. So he's still testing God. And the way that Gideon has stated this test, it's kind of the reverse of what nature does. Um, to have the dew on the floor, um, not on the floor, but on the fleece only, um, and dry on the earth. When the dew comes in the morning, the dew hits the ground, and the, and the ground is wet, right? right? So he's saying, let the earth be dry and let the fleece be wet. So something supernatural, which means not according to nature, but super, supremely over nature, something natural. He says, I want you to show me something supernatural if I'm going to win this battle. And Gideon said unto God, oh, hold on a second, verse 38. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. So in the morning, God answered his, 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 uh, his test. The ground was dry, and the fleece was full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let nothing 
thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray, but this once. With the fleece, let it now be dry upon the fleece, and upon the ground let it be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry upon the fleece only, and the dew was on the ground. God is sure patient, isn't he? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and if, if Lord willing, I'll be back next week to go on to chapter 7. But what happened in the morning, Gideon says, listen, I want the fleece now to be dry and the ground to be wet. How many of you know if you put fleece out there when the dew comes, everything's going to be wet? Except when God does something, the fleece is dry. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is truth. I thank you that it was established in the heavenlies. It does not change, Lord God. And I thank you for your faithfulness to your people. I pray right now, if there's anyone by the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they'll say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. Come into my heart to be the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. I thank you in Jesus' name. And as people say, Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, you're now a child of God. Amen. Let him be the Lord of your life and the Savior of your soul. Amen. 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 God is good. Hey, just before.